Eric's very good, not so bad doomsday. Next on Eternal Dirtles. Extreme thank you to all the Dirtomaniacs that support the show. If you want to get ad-free content and extra free content, you can go to patreon.com slash eternal dirtles and support us. Proceeds go to editing the show, upgrading equipment, and helping us travel to events. What it do? All right. In three, two. Hello and welcome to Eternal Dirtles. I'm your host, Zach Clark. And with me this week, special guest, challenge winner, Eric Witkowski. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Zach. It's great to have you back, man. Uh, and and under and un- under such auspicious circumstances, you know. Uh, you so correct me if I'm wrong. You nine owed this thing. I did. Yeah, Whew. it was. Uh, it was a good run. The deck really lined up, and the. I mean, and I think I think probably I drew a little bit above average, and my opponents drew a little bit below average, and it was a lot of fun. I have to I have to point that out. I yeah. really just had a lot of fun playing. It's fun to uh, win, obviously, but also, you know making the right plays and really considering things. It was a lot of fun. Oh uh, yeah, man. I mean, in the lead up to eternal weekend, that's got to feel good. You got to feel, uh, feel like you've got a little bit of confidence run into the, to the big weekend. Eternal Dirtles is proud to be sponsored by Moxfield. Moxfield is the best magic, the gathering deck building website on the internet. You can create, share and find decks from commander to legacy and even fan supported formats like pre-modern and old school. You can see all of our decks on our Moxfield Follow the links below to stay tuned. Yeah, it's good to have the momentum. Also, four people that I played in Swiss top aided that challenge. So it wasn't like a bunch of jabronis yeah. that were <laughs> that were scrabbling for the, the one four bracket at the end. Yeah. So yeah, I mean I'm confident in that deck. Obviously, there's still room to improve. Um and I think I'm probably leaning towards playing that deck at Eternal Weekend. I still go back and forth with uh with Turbo, but we we can talk about that or yeah yeah. We're you were talking this. about different styles of Doomsday. I was like, you're yeah, not gonna yeah. play Doomsday. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so so let's talk about the let's talk about the build first before before we get into it. And we'll have a deck list below of your current build. But um one of the questions I wanted to ask you uh, once we get into it is is has has anything changed over the course of the the new set of Dustmore coming out? Is any is anything new there? No. Okay. No no changes with that. Um, obviously, I think the meta might shift a little bit with yeah. the um, revelation of Metamorphosis Fanatic, but nothing has changed in ter- in Tempo Doomsday, which is what I played over the weekend. All right. Well, uh, so so give give everyone a quick you know for the layman. Who's coming here, seeing you for the first time, hearing about Doomsday for the first time. Tell us a little bit about the deck. Okay. I want to start this by giving a huge shout out to Mike Reed. That's Eureka2242. He's been doing a ton of work on this deck. And I I would describe him as one of the primary players and people that has been working on both the plan for this deck and the intricate like individual card choices. I helped him over the last few weeks with some editing um, and we played together a little bit. He was a huge help. I learned so much. I mean, he's definitely a better tempo doomsday player than me. And like even leading up to it, like every choice and discussing plays, I have to, I have to give a ton of credit to Mike Reed. So I want to start with that. Shout out to Mike Reed. Uh, Um, So, so you were saying tempo doomsday. So yes, let's differentiate the types of doomsday first. Okay. Turbo Doomsday plays more fast mana sources and plays personal tutor because pretty much the only plan in that deck is to get Doomsday on the stack as quick as possible. So it is really straight up just waste of the combo itself. That's Doomsday, fast as Oracle, and personal tutor to find it. A few cantrips and a bunch of fast mana. And that's all you're doing. You could maybe say, and I've said this before on this podcast, that there's a plan B of attacking with Street Wraith, but we both know that's not a real plan. (laughs) (laughs) So that brings us to Tempo Doomsday, which if I can step aside for one second here is actually the first version of Doomsday that I played. My origin story as a Doomsday player is uh, some some Doomsday streamers, uh, I think Kai Sawatari was playing a Tempo Doomsday list. This is two years ago now. So they were playing Delver, Baleful Strix, 
Merktide region. And I was like, that looks pretty cool. And you don't have to have an LED for that. So I sleeved it up and I took it to Game Storia and I went 4-0. And I was like, this is, this is fun. The big difference between Tempo Doomsday and regular Doomsday is you do have a legitimate plan B. And with the advent of Tamiyo and Psychic Frog, obviously Psychic Frog being one of the premier threats in the format right now, if not the specific thing that many decks are built around, that and Tamiyo, they actually have not only this ability to be creature threats that have to be solved all on their own by your opponent, but they also can work into the Doomsday plan. And that's something that I'm not sure Doomsday, Tempo Doomsday has had before. When it was Delver, Baleful Strix, and Murktide Regent, sure, you could potentially grow your Murktide Regent to a huge uh, power and toughness by resolving a Doomsday, but they were attacking for damage. What I've learned about this deck is that Psychic Frog adds one devotion. It can draw you a card. It can chump block for a turn. It can just do all these things. Tamiyo gets to her ultimate pretty quick, and you can use the minus ability to bring back an Edge of Autumn to make mana. You can get back a Doomsday that's been countered. You can get a Cantrip. They just have all of these functions. So what they allow you to do is play a tempo game. You don't have that much disruption. There's Days and Force of Will, so that's what make it similar to any other tempo deck. This list has a few fatal pushes between the main deck and the sideboard. But what you're trying to do is basically overload with tempo threats so that your doomsday is more effective. If that's and, a And it seems like this is a deck also that uh if you haven't sort of revealed what you're doing, an opponent might not be respecting the doomsday, right? Yeah, that absolutely happens. The the two parts, and I know we're gonna talk about the surprise factor, but if you're just playing Tamiyo and you're playing Frog, they have to deal with those. And whether they know your Doomsday or not, they're going to expend resources, whether that looks like trying to counter the Frog on the way down, whether they're wasting a push on that at the beginning, or a Swords to Plowshares, for example. And then you come out of left field with this Doomsday, they might not have anything left to fight it with. Because similar to Blue Black Reanimator, it's a combo finish in a tempo deck. And yeah. we know that that deck is really strong. I would say that their combo is a little bit cheaper. You know, Entomb costs one mana and Reanimate costs one mana. Plus, once you get something in there, you can just draw the other part off the top. Doomsday is a little trickier, but not susceptible to people playing main deck Nile Spellbomb, for example. Yeah. Or uh, better, certainly in a mirror... If you're playing the the blue black dooms or blue black reanimator mirror, they could reanimate your stuff. Or if you're playing straight up reanimator, like that's a concern. That's something you have to play around. Whereas doomsday still a spell based combo deck, so uh, you don't die to fury, you don't die to those things. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, but. so let's let's talk about the uh, your tournament. So we're gonna run down, uh, you know, uh, each each match. In, in, in a truncated way, we don't want to like talk about every single yeah. play, but we want to talk about what, what mattered in the match and then ha how you sideboarded. Um, sure. I'm assuming you probably saw a lot of blue-black reanimator, so there'll be if we run into a lot of those, maybe we'll say it was blue-black reanimator again. <laughs> I didn't play against that deck a single time. Wow, wow, <laughs> amazing! All right, I mean yeah. this is a you know this is a this is a surprise to me. Um, yeah. All right, so let's talk about uh, round one. Okay, I played. Uh, Blue Black Tempo. Okay. Um, and so I'll preface this entire conversation by saying there are a couple of different sideboard plans, but the main one is Doomsday just coming out. And that's what you do against Blue Black Tempo. Doomsday has traditionally been really bad against Tempo decks. They have Disruption and a Clock. And this deck just tries to fully pivot onto a creature plan with Merktide Regent, more removal, and Barrel Goyf, which is a key player. Barrel Goyf uh, gets big and it draws you into uh, more creatures. Um, if you can leverage the mana advantage, because I'm playing Dark Ritual and Lotus Petal, that's how you get ahead of those decks. And that's exactly what happened. So I won game one. I lost game two. I won game three. After game one, I just straight up took out all of my doomsdays. Um, you can try to next level and say in game three, okay, they... They have, a, if you see a bunch of consigns or other anti uh, doomsday stuff, you could board back into it. 
what I chose to do in this specific matchup because I know that Blue Black Tempo has a lot of removal and they have a lot of consigns and everything. I just waited a long time between games two and three to make it seem like maybe I was sideboarding back into it and then just ran with the creatures that I had. I mean, I wasn't it's, doing anything during that it's time. It's so funny that, that you said that because I was just talking. To, so uh, the episode previous to this uh, was recorded on the same day. John Lee won a challenge uh, playing Blue Black Reanimator. And I was, ta- and, and for the last three episodes, actually, I've been talking about this concept of the, the double juke sideboard. When you decide to like <laughs> have your backup play in the sideboard, and then, uh, and then you, based on what what you think the vibes are, deciding whether or not you're going to sideboard in your plan or stay with the main plan, and doing things online, it's much easier to do because you can your, your opponent doesn't see your hands, you know, they're not right. see, seeing you shuffle your deck together and whatnot. But when you when we get to uh, Eternal Weekend, you know, yeah, people are probably going to be paying attention to to what you're doing in between rounds. But not everyone pays as much attention in that game three. They just shuffle up their they're in their own head. So it's something people should think about. And I heard you say that it might have been on the last episode. Yeah, it was where the, you that was about, the last episode, yeah. Okay. So you were like, people should be doing this. You should always take your sideboard out and you should always mess around some cards. I think that in person, I absolutely do that. I, I'm not a person who always shuffles all 15 cards in and then takes out the worst <laughs> 15 cards. Someone told me that a long time ago, and I'm like, that's absurd i don't want to take the entire round but it's extremely hard yeah. to do when you when you're a deck that may go to time as well because every every second may count yeah i i don't think that that's going to happen for doomsday but each person should make their own decision yeah. based on what they know about their deck yeah okay so so we... uh round two okay round two i played against eldrazi um and the plan against eldrazi is to drop out of Doomsday, like you try the Juke first. They have such a fast clock and they have trouble with Barrel Goyf and Murktide. So you're bringing in a couple of consigned to memory, Barrel Goyfs and Murktides, taking out all the Doomsday stuff and like maybe a couple of Tamios. Um, let me see if I can see on my notes here, like exactly what. Baragoy specifically being good against them because that lifelink really does matter. That that buys you time. Yeah, it swings the it swings the the race really well, and it, it draws cards. Yeah, that's like the hidden. Yeah, it's mode like an abyss, that... or it draws you cards. It's like one or the other. They have to block it, right? They do, um, and it's going to kill whatever they block with. I w- also want to point out that um, during this ex- this specific tournament, and this is going to make me seem like more of a chump. I discovered that I can put creatures back on top of my deck with Brainstorm and then draw them with uh, with Barrel Goyf, which is reminiscent of a play that I absolutely love in Pauper, which is getting your Squadron Hawks out of your deck and then putting them back on top with your Brainstorm. It's like drawing five cards yeah. with your Brainstorm. So that matchup went, re- went really well. Uh, consigned to memory, I happen to have both of mine in the second game, and I don't remember that game being particularly close. Okay. Kind of just, yeah, early Barrel Goy for early Murktide. I don't remember which. We don't need to get into it, but I just, like, ran away with it and ripped the second Consign off the top. And Consign is so good against them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially, you know, especially a deck like that that can also play, you know, uh, Chalice of the Void or something. You can just rip right past it with, uh, with the Replicate. Yeah, it gets past their main <laughs> disruption. And it uh, it counters all their stuff and all the abilities on their cast triggers. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. Uh, round three. Also, before we go, I want to point out that my round two opponent was one of the people that made top eight. Okay. Round three was also someone that made top eight. And they were playing Mystic Forge combo. Um, and I got this one 2-0. The Sounds like board... another deck that was very good with uh, Consigned to Memory. <laughs> consigned to Memory was big there. <laughs> and that shores up a little bit of a weakness in this is explicitly in the mystic forge fast combo tempo doomsday does struggle a little bit there yeah because that's the deck that's not as big on the disruption so that's where turbo doomsday is like a little bit better right? yeah yeah turbo doomsday historically as like combo control you're bringing in a bunch of force negation and maybe even more discard really good against other combo decks uh as evidenced by some prominent <laughs> uh, combo pilots really disliking uh, Doomsday as a matchup because of that. But 
I don't have those. I have two consigns, one extra thought sees, and one force negation in the sideboard because you need a threat density. So there's more creatures, less disruption overall. Um, Bobble makes a lot of that disruption kind of sketchy. Um, and I think my hands lined up really well in game two. Um, <laughs> I kind of YOLO cycled a Wraith and drew the Doomsday, and then it was it was kind of over. <laughs> Better lucky than good, right? <laughs> yep. You got to get lucky to win. Yep. There's no, no way you do it without that. Yep. All right. So into game four, you're 3-0 at this point. I am. Round four was against Mono Black Reanimator with a sideboard Witherbloom Apprentice uh, Chain of Smog. Uh, Chain of Smog, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's kind of good that in game two, which I did lose, but they tried to sideboard for that. Um, I think that they're, they're tr if they're trying to juke my very limited graveyard hate, I'm actually happy with that. I'm I'm better if they're if they're putting in like some slower Witherbloom apprentices and less just fast reanimate stuff. If they get an Archon or a Gristlebrand into play, that game's over. And this um, is the World Gorger deck, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this specific one had it, but it was mono black. That means no face I looting. Like, I feel like if you're seeing a Gristlebrand, War Gorger is almost like a guarantee at that point. Could be uh, yeah. some contemporary lists. They're they're putting it back in red black because um, they need more. They they want the game to be over and they need to draw all their discard. Yeah. So outside of blue black reanimator, they want to just draw all those cards. But this one was two one. They won game two. Um, I think it was low resources and and they they drew a reanimate before I drew a doomsday. The plan against all the reanimator decks, I've got the two graph diggers cage and the sideboard, but I'm often taking out frog. It's kind okay. of okay if they reanimate a tamio. But it's bad news if they yeah. reanimate Frog, because of course they can get their stuff into the graveyard. Um, so those all come out. And that's another reason that we're even playing the Graft Digger's Cage, because it keeps them from reanimating a Street Wraith or a Tamio, were that to be important anyway. Yeah. All right, on to round five. It's another top eight participant. They were playing four color Nadu Control. Four color Nadu Control. Now, four to, are we talking like breakfast kind of deck or this is just like a mono control like they're targeting their i, I kind of want to bring up their <laughs> list but i yeah. didn't see they had no uh thassa's oracle in the deck and it, okay. there was no uh there might have been the nomads but they were playing like the main deck swords to plowshares and they did have force of wills which i think sets it aside okay. from some nadu decks some of the turbo like nadu combo decks are not playing force of will main they have other disruption in the sideboard, maybe Force of Wills, but also sometimes like Flusterstorm or for spell based stuff. You, this were they playing uh, uh, Dryad Arbor? I think so. Okay. Let's, that, let's so, so, yeah, this is like the more fair Nadu. Yeah, it's a control yeah. list. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. on. <laughs> Hopefully, that's a fair way of saying it. <laughs> and I don't, my sideboard is very limited. Like, maybe I bring in the Force of Negation for a Green Sun Zenith, definitely bringing in the Thought Seize. And then after that, almost nothing. The creature plan isn't very good if they have swords to plowshares. Um, and I just want to jam Doomsday with protection. Um, so like maybe I throw a Tamio and a frog out there expecting them to get swords. Yeah. But that's helpful because it makes their endurances less uh, less efficacious. They're less, less effective. <laughs> I don't know why I stumbled over that. But they... Uh, I don't feel as, as good as with Turbo Doomsday because I don't have as much counterplay. I don't have Vexing Baubles. I don't have as much discard. Something weird, I think, happened in this one. Um, like, I was put in a position where I pretty much had to go for it in the second game, and I, like, lose to almost anything, and they just didn't have it. So sometimes that's, you know, again, got better lucky than good. But yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at this list. Four consigned to memory in the sideboard. I was sure that they would have one of those. Um, on the very last play of the game, they green suns for three. And being worried about Leovold, I cycled all my cards, which means they could... I cycled like Edge of Autumn and a couple of Street Race, which means if they get Endurance, all those things go back into my deck yeah. and I have to... It takes going to take time for me to get back through them. But of course, 
I, I can't have Leovold come into play. Yeah. And they got a Nadu. And I, I don't know. I, I could not figure out what was in their hand. Like Doomsday Resolve. So it wasn't a blue card. Um, it wasn't consigned to memory. Or they would have left that up. So I just, I don't know what they had. Um, yeah. Maybe the was thinking, Leovold was in their hand? <laughs> or the Endurance was in their hand? Yeah, perhaps. Um because they could have pitch cast it if they had another green card mm-hmm. and the deck, it has a lot of green. So if it was in their hand, they could have done that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, on to the next round. Yeah. Round six. Also a top eight competitor. Um, wow. It was four color bean control. Um, this is a deck that I've, I, so I've been playing this a lot, but man, I am just not hype on this deck for uh for uh you know uh, eternal weekend because there's so many blood moons going around right now but here's a guy who who you know made it to the, the he's x and o as well i'm assuming or at least x and one yeah i this is we're on round six now yeah uh i kind of just was like i didn't expect to make it this far i'm gonna play the round i don't know if they said anything to me about letting them get in i did see that uh max wonder pro was sitting at four and two. And so I w- was going to try and throw a bone to my uh, fellow Doomsday player and see if I could win out and get them into top eight. Um, I also think there's s- some truth to the like. Can I make it a little aside, Zach? Yeah. Are you a baseball fan? I, I am a baseball fan. I'm actually, uh, I'm not a huge baseball fan, <laughs> but enough that like, I was like, shit, do we want to just like wait till the game is over before we start recording? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm marginally a Detroit Tigers fan. Oh. And maybe you heard about how they went 31 and 13 over the last month of baseball to squeak into the playoffs after being like 0.2% to make it. If you're playing baseball at that level with your back against the wall for two months, maybe you'd have some play when you get to the playoffs. I'm not going to punt round six to go pee or whatever. I want to be on my game when I go into the top eight. So <laughs> I played it out. Yeah. And I won that one also 2-0. I had really good Doomsday hands, like Turn 1, Ritual Doomsday, uh, Force of Will Days. I just had the right stuff yeah. and just run them over, which is, of course, an out that this deck has. That's It's a really important part about uh, Tempo Doomsday. You have that I win button, which, again, I heard on your last episode talking about how it's so important to be doing something that powerful and proactive in Legacy right now. Yeah. Um, all right. So you're in your number one seed into the top eight, right? Yeah. Just cruised right in there. Six oh my and gosh. <laughs> so based on this, uh, I'm going to guess you played one of your previous opponents in the first round. I didn't. <laughs> nope. I, and I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, it, it would have, I actually had a only coin flip played... of a chance. Here. <laughs> yeah, you did. Cause you know, four of them were in the top eight. I actually didn't play anyone that I played before until the finals. Okay. So uh, I don't know exactly how they do it. Do they reseed? Do they make a bracket? Yeah. So I, I mean, I only know for, you know, how it works in regular magic tournaments, not online necessarily, but I'm pretty sure they just reseed everybody. So you're, you're one to eight, two to seven, you know, three to six and four to five. Because interestingly, in the second round of top eight, I did not play the existing lowest seed. I played the number five seed, I think. So maybe it's similar to like March Madness, where one and eight are on the same side of the bracket as four and five. Perhaps, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe someone someone in the comments will know. Yeah, someone exactly how they they do it. Like school me on this. I'd I'd love to know. But I played Eldrazi. So okay. I was up against that again. Um, and in game one, I just had a big ass psychic frog that allowed me to go fast through a doomsday pile. Uh, oh, like yeah. once, once it's accumulating resources and you have st- stuff in your graveyard, you can a co- really common play. And this is an important thing. Again, shout out to Mike Reed. You can have some stuff in your graveyard give your psychic frog flying because your graveyard is about to disappear, cast doomsday, set up your pile, draw your first card with psychic frog. Psychic frog is also interesting in a, in a world where uh, endurance lives because you could then uh, block an endurance, right? 
you can block it and you can eat your own graveyard in response yeah. to them endurancing. Yeah, which by, is, by, by block, that's what I meant. It, it, yeah, yeah. It, you know, not actually block it. <laughs> well, this is what I was saying in the intro about how diverse the uses of Psychic Frog yeah. are. Its power really syncs up well with Doomsday. In this specific matchup against Eldrazi, it's really good against Kozilek's command. Because okay. with, uh, with Turbo Doomsday, you have to be concerned about a Kozilek's command. If you empty your pile, they can make you draw a card and you lose. Because uh -huh. Kozilek's command says target player. Target player, okay. And they can exile your Oracle with it. So if you do not plan for that, it is possible to work around with cyclers. Yeah. Like once they put Kozilek's command on the stack, if you have a cycler, you make them choose that mode ahead of time. And if they exile the Thassa's Oracle, you can draw out of the pile and they don't target you with the draw. If they do target you with the draw, you're going to win anyway. Yeah. Because you draw your last card, whatever. But Psychic Frog gives you one devotion. So if they haven't already used their Kozilex command to make sure they're not losing to your Psychic Frog, you draw into your pile, you go down to one card, you put Thassa's Oracle on the stack. It doesn't matter what they do. They can't make you draw out of it. They can't kill the Oracle and get, get you. So, so many applications everywhere. Yeah. Obviously, I just say, what MVP happens if they card. choose both? But that's the Psychic Frog, yep. right? Yeah. Okay. You draw the last card and you, you set it up so you have only one card left and then you, you win from there. Perfect. And I, I got that one 2-0. Again, uh, you're kind of sideboarding out of Doomsday in the second one because they have trouble with Barrel Goyf. And um, yeah, I think, I think I drew more Barrel Goyfs than they drew Devour of Destiny in game two. So took that one down too. All right. On to the uh, semifinals. Yes, this was a matchup I was dreading. I played against Punishing Waterfalls, and I knew from previous challenges that they had top aided that they were playing this blue red wizards deck. It doesn't oh, matter yeah. how it's configured; it is terrible for Doomsday. Like the stuff they're bringing in from the cyborg and in addition to what they have in their main deck, I mean, main deck flame of Anor is flame of so Anor. bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause again, they can make you draw. And if you don't set it up, right, they're either going to kill the Oracle and then you lose, or they're going to make you draw two cards and then you lose. Then you lose. They yeah. Have, Oof. <laughs> they have days and force of will. So I went into this, like trying to stay optimistic, but feeling like I was really behind. Um, I lost game one. It was very close. There, if I had had a, the right draw on the very last turn of the game, I kind of had to YOLO a Doomsday into their Tamiyo that was about to ultimate. Um, obviously, if Tamiyo ultimates, uh, I'm going to lose because they're going to draw half their deck and they're going to have a bunch of Force of Wills, whatever consignment memories they have in, in the main deck. I, don't, I, I know they don't play that now, but whatever stuff they're getting. And if I had drawn any a free cantrip or a dark ritual i think i still would have had a chance they let the doomsday resolve um but they may they may have still had force of will i can't remember the exact game situation but essentially i had to use my tamio to bring back a fatal push which i used to kill a magus of the moon with my onboard pedal tamio again getting me really close um and and i just didn't have the uh, the mana or the cards to go that turn. So I cast Doomsday, it resolved, they ultimated their Tamiyo, and then I think they just played another Magus and I, I died because I couldn't, yeah. couldn't even cast it. Like that pile, I didn't even take very much time on because I knew I basically lost to everything. So feeling really behind in that matchup and figured that the plan was just had to be Barrel Goyf. That's the thing that they're really going to struggle with. Yeah. And they have Snapcasters and Bolts and Unholy Heats. Like Sometimes it's, it's Flame of Honor can do just five damage to a Goyf and get it. Yeah. And with the way these two decks are, it's probably not going to get to be above a 4-5. Um, I have Artifacts with Petals, but Land, Creature, Instant Sorcery, Petal, I'm not sure where anything else is coming from. Maybe in, a Planeswalker. That matchup. But Maybe. Not, not Tamiyo. Right. Yeah. Tamiyo is not a, a planeswalker in the graveyard. I don't know if they're playing any. They were playing Tamiyo. And in the in game one, we had dueling Tamios. I mean, I already mentioned that. I had to pick up the the fatal push and yeah. punishing waterfalls was, was about to flip. So Doomsday just straight up came out. And I, I asked to bookmark this at the beginning. In this matchup, I did not even consider bringing Doomsday back in. Like 
when their main deck is so well set up, it doesn't do me any good to try and trick them. I'm going to be all in on a Barrel Goyf plan. That's just what I have to do. Either I draw it and I maybe have a chance or I don't. And they're, all their cards line up against, like almost every card in that deck beats Doomsday. Yeah. And that's how it played out. Uh, in game two, I, again, I think that I probably drew above average and they probably drew below average. Um, but I, I played a bunch of threats. I want to say that I had like Tamiyo into Frog, which they have many ways to deal with. They've got Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast. And then eventually I landed a Barrel Goyf. And obviously they still, even though they have a lot of tools, they still have to deal with Tamiyo and Frog. Like they can't get away with just letting those things go because they'll answer them later. That's not really an option. Yeah, they'll just run away with the game. Yep. And I think I might have drawn a couple of Barrel Goyfs or I got one on the table fast. So that won that one. That won that game. And then in game three, there was a, a play that I'm particularly proud of. Um, and, you know, Punishing Waterfalls posted their tournament to the to to YouTube. So I was able to see it from the other perspective. Oh, I'll um, have to link that below so we can, yes. Yeah. They, I played an Underground Sea and they they played a land. They played an Ottawara. So I'm I'm safe from days. And maybe they either played a Tamiyo or Cantripped. But I think I had a turn one Barrel Goyf. May have had the turn one. And I I had a daze in hand that I wanted I was really worried about Wasteland because at that moment it may have been my only land. So when they untapped and use their Ottawara to play a cantrip, I snap dazed it. On their on their stream, the th idea was that I had some crazy read that it was their only land, but I didn't. I wanted to get max value out of my days. Yeah. And I wanted to protect my underground seat. I was going to daze almost anything because I just wanted to have that land available of to cast on the next turn. And as it turned out, they didn't have another land. So they missed a land drop on that turn. I played the Underground Sea. I thought seized them. I took their last cantrip. They drew a Wasteland for turn and Wastelanded me. But at that point, I was, I was really Goyfin. far ahead. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> Barrel Goyf was starting to draw more cards. I did. I did draw out of my own low land situation. But it, a lot of the game hinged on that first days. Wow. Um, and really punishing in the, you know, as per their name for what was a below average draw. Like if they draw yeah. any land there, I'm going to be in trouble. They're back in the game. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was a, a pivotal moment in the tournament. It was the first moment that I was like, oh, I bet I can beat this deck. Like maybe finally it seems like there's a window here. Um, and sometimes you have to play for that high upside. Like uh, if I had had the crazy read to days, simply because I thought they were on one yeah. leg. I think that's still defensible because yeah. like I'm so behind in the matchup. I need to be trying anything. It's, it's like the classic, do I, do I wasteland on turn one? Yeah. You know, historically, if you're on the draw, they say the power, they like good players say, don't do that. Cause you're putting yourself behind on mana unless it's the only play you have and you have to swing for the fences and take that shot. So yeah. I would describe that as the fourth reason that I did it. Yeah. Uh, number one, my days wasn't getting any better. Number two, I wanted to protect my underground C. Um, I'm I'm sure there was a third reason, but that's how I've been framing this particular tempo. play. Yeah, <laughs> tempo. Yeah, that's tempo, right? right? right just just keep <laughs> the them. The fourth keep reason them down. is always tempo. Oh, I thought of the third reason. Okay, they played Tamio on turn one. I didn't want them flipping Tamio off of another ponder. I if see. they ponder off Ottawara and I let it resolve, then they can flip the Tamiyo with another land and a ponder. Yeah. If they have land brainstorm, they're flipping it anyway. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't, I can't stop that, but I can stop that. So that was my reasoning at the time. And it turned into be, turned out to be amazing. A, real, a game winning play. All so, right. So that was, that was game two. That was game three. That was, game, sorry, that, that yeah, was that was over. game three. Yeah. Okay, good. Game two, uh, like, Barrel Goyfin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think there was a Merktide region involved, too. Just overwhelmed their removal, which is abundant, but 
I drew the right part of the deck. So there. on to the finals, I'm going to guess, right? So we've got Mystic Forge combo, Eldrazi, five color uh, control, huh? <laughs> Eldrazi. Nope. Nope. Okay. What was it? Mystic Forge combo. Mystic, I was like, there's no way five color control made it through all of that. There's no way. <laughs> Yeah, sorry I couldn't give you better news there with you, if you've been putting in time on control, yeah. but um, yeah, and that one went to three, so it was uh, there were definitely moments where things were looking grim. I got brainstorm locked early in game three, but Psychic Frog bailed me out, drew me into Doomsday at the right time, and I remember very clearly after Doomsday resolved, I might have had like a single counter spell. They might have had a saga going to get Vexing Bauble, so like it's going to shut that off anyway. They had nine mana when all was said and done between their, their Grim Shaggies. Monoliths and their. Uh, they played Karn, and then they got Pithing Needle. They didn't have enough for Michael Synth Lattice. I mean, that's what they felt was their best play. And they shut off the one, they shut off Edge of Autumn, which was in the pile, which they can tell from yeah. looking through what I have after Doomsday's resolve. But I had Brainstorm in hand, which let me just shuffle around the cards enough that it didn't matter. So there you go. You know, by the hair of a single mana in a deck that's built to produce a ton of it. The hair of your chinny chin chin, as they say. Yep. <laughs> and then I just kind of sat there because it was 3 a.m. and I had to go to work in four hours. And uh, I felt like my clients were not going to care that I had won yeah. the challenge. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell people at the airport that I that I like did really well at Magic the night before. No one, no, they're like, okay, nerd. Yeah. I'm Shout like, you guys to... are IT people. Give me a break. <laughs> How come you don't understand any of this? <laughs> Shout out to uh, Chris Benucci, who always makes that joke. Like he's talking to his barista about, play patterns <laughs> yeah he's like so the other day i uh brainstormed and fetched and you know like no <laughs> yeah no one cares <laughs> yeah that's awesome man so nine and oh that is a hell of a finish um and a pretty uh pretty amazing uh couple couple of rounds there where you just like got there and a couple of great plays uh always awesome to to get a name drop of punishing wi waterfalls on the on the show and I'm a big fan of Flame of Honor. Uh, I, I did a whole video on Flame of Honor, and it saw almost no play in the format. So, so they're, they're rocking happy. it and make, making you feel good. Yeah, yeah. It's always good to see. See that, yeah, I can look back and be like, I was right. They're obviously an excellent player. I thought yeah. I was behind there. Um, and You guys uh, you guys were actually on, on the show together. Uh, that 25 Magic players talk about the ban list. Uh both you and uh, Punishing Waterfalls were on were on that show. But it was a preview of this Friday night challenge played by forty two <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, Eric, I know I know you uh, you've been working like a maniac, so I don't want to I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But I did want to qu make a quick announcement. Uh, we just now uh, moments ago hit. 2000 subscribers on YouTube. So that's a huge thing. I'm happy that I'm, I'm uh, extremely chuffed that uh, you were on the show uh, when that happened. Uh, that's, that's a super awesome uh, thing. Cause I know last year when I first reached out to you, we were on that, we were on that uh, run to like hit a thousand. And now like, here we are like a year later, you know, uh, to, uh, to 2000. So next year, I think the goal is 5,000 uh, subscribers. So we'll see. I'll do what I can. <laughs> if, if I'm if I'm good luck, knock on doors. <laughs> tell your barista. You know, <laughs> you know we have an election coming up. Yeah, but uh, I'll I'll just say forget about that. Here's what you need to do. Yeah. Just Here's start handing out stickers, your at, <laughs> QR codes at the at the voting booth. <laughs> do you want to talk about anything else? I know that we're heading up to time. You mentioned maybe talking about. Uh, doomsday's position in the meta yeah let's talk about doomsday's position in the meta because that's something you know w where uh I, th I think people people are a little bit curious yeah i don't think turbo doomsday is great right now it might be able to get some people because it's going to punish as, as i've said on this podcast before it'll always punish sort of early round stuff that you see that person that's bringing nick fit or an out-of-date lands deck and hasn't played people it in who that live long. in P uh, pittsburgh and own cards Yes, Turbo Doomsday always punishes that stuff. 
Dave yeah. Kaplan famously told me that he needed me to be playing Doomsday so that I could get rid of all that in the early rounds, <laughs> and then he can just beat me in the late rounds. Uh, so did he see you in the late rounds? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have never run into Dave late enough in a tournament for that to be prophetic. So I don't think Turbo Doomsday is, is particularly well suited. I do think Tempo Doomsday is. It is attacking on the same general strategy as Blue Black Reanimator. It plays some must answer threats, Tamio and Psychic Frog, as I said earlier, and then it has an I win button. And that's yeah. what you need to be doing to have any kind of game against what are probably the top three decks Blue Black stuff or blue black reanimator eldrazi and painter yep those are the those are my three like those seem like the three decks to be playing painter or red prison like one of those two uh is 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 at that three spot for sure yeah and they're all doing proactive stuff they're all gonna kill you really quick if you stumble at all so it i was surprised at how effective this other plan is in Tempo Doomsday. Like uh, previously, the idea was you're blanking all of their removal. And so you start playing creatures and you have to worry a little bit about that. But the truth is that Tamio and Psychic Frog are kind of distractions if you're on the Doomsday plan. And if you're not, then they can win the game on their own if that's how the game lines up. There's really, I like how intricate that first part is. Like the first part of the game before Doomsday is really important. Um, they're just, they're really important cards. Yeah, I don't know if this deck could exist without Psychic Frog. So I guess we'll see what happens in December when we all think that maybe Psychic Frog will get banned. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> Back to Turbo Doomsday at that point. Yeah, then I'll just rock a bunch of Vexing Bobbles because that card deck is barrels, really awful right? to play again. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's good enough. Yeah. Seems like it seems like a solid plan. Um, yeah. Well. Well, Eric. Uh, again, thanks for coming on uh, such short notice. And uh, and uh, again, like awesome. It's always good to see to see friends uh, do well, but even better at this time of the year when we're really uh, everyone's pushing to uh, to you know be ready for Eternal Weekend. Thanks for having me on, Zach. I know that you should be playing games right now because I heard you're behind in the. Uh, yeah, I'm very behind. <laughs> I, I decided that I was going to start uh, do, recording uh, uh, other people's uh, other people's wins instead of do, trying to work on my own this week. But uh, I I will be. I'm I'm still at two right now. Uh, and and this is t- what is today? Today is Tuesday. Yeah, is it a Tuesday? Right. Today is Tuesday. <laughs> uh, so I, I plan on trying to get in. Uh, probably two leagues tomorrow that is my hope just okay bounce two leagues right off and uh and see how i feel about that and i'm, I'm going to try and do reanimator and breakfast and see how i feel about those decks and kind of make it make another decision from there okay right on well yeah. good luck and may your testing always be effective i hope <laughs> all right right back at you anyhow uh thank you everybody for watching and uh have a good one like subscribe do all that stuff uh we'll catch you next time Before you go, I need some help. Please subscribe to this channel and do your part to help sustain the legacy content ecosystem. Just subscribing to this channel goes a long way to reminding YouTube that people love and support this format. Now, if you really want to go the extra mile, you should think about supporting us through Patreon. Both the links for subscription and Patreon are right here. And if you're listening on an audio format, you can go to patreon.com slash eternal Thanks so much for watching.